Hello, everybody. My name is Susan Morrissey, and I am Assistant Managing Editor for the Government and Policy Group of CNN and moderator of today's webinar. Thank you for joining us for today's webcast. Through CNN webinars, we hope to deliver critical information to select audiences in a timely and interactive manner. Although the formats may vary, all webinars share a few things in common. First, each webinar comes to you through funding by a sponsor. CNN works with sponsors to identify topics of interest and value to CNN's audience and consistent with CNN's mission. In all cases, a webinar topic would be one that CNN would cover or is already covering in its news gathering operations. Second, each webinar will be archived at CNN online and at the sponsor's website after the live webcast. This way, those who cannot join us today can access the information and discuss it at a later time. During the webinar, you can adjust the size of the slides on your screen by grabbing the lower right corner with your mouse and moving it. If you need technical assistance, please look at the Help widget at the bottom of your screen or type your query into the Q&A box. If you are disconnected during the webcast, please log in again according to the instructions you received earlier. And again, each webinar's success depends on your participation. Please feel free to ask questions at any time during the presentation through the Q&A box on your screen. At the end of the presentation, I, as your moderator, will pose as many questions as time permits. And lastly, CNN does not endorse any company, product, or services that may be mentioned in the webinar. Having said that, I am delighted to welcome you to today's webinar, which is being sponsored by Thermo Fisher Scientific, a world leader in servicing science. Thermo Scientific provides analytical technologies, reagents, consumables, services, and software from cutting-edge scientific research to routine applications. In today's presentation, we'll hear from two speakers. The first will be Dr. Richard F. Jack, who is the Manager of Global Market Development for Chromatography at Thermo Fisher Scientific. Richard works with regulatory agencies around the world to assist them in developing robust analytical methods that are eventually used for compliance monitoring. By bringing customer problems to his company's attention, he facilitates development of new applications, instrumentation, column chemistries, and software that provide customers real solutions. Richard is co-author for EPA Method 557 and has also drafted several ASTM methods. Following Richard will be Herb Wagner, an analytical chemist in the Environmental Division of the Shaw Group. Herb has been employed with the Environmental Division of the Shaw Group on contract with the EPA Office of Groundwater and Drinking Water in Cincinnati since 1997. He has been instrumental in IC and 2D IC drinking water method development projects for EPA and is principal author of EPA Method 317, 326, and 302 for bromate analysis and EPA methods 314 and 314.1 for analysis of perchlorate in drinking water. Herb is currently involved with the development of 2D IC methods for the analysis and regulated haloacetic acids in drinking water. Prior to moving to the U.S. in 1997, he spent almost 25 years in, as an analytical environmental chemist at Labatt's Brewing Company in London, Ontario, in Canada and two years on contract with the Health Protection Branch of Health Canada in Ontario. Herb obtained a chemical technologist degree in 1964, ABS in chemistry from State University of New York in 1968, and an MS in environmental science from the University of Western Ontario in 1995. He has published 49 scientific articles for the analysis of trace contaminants in beverages and drinking water. I am now happy to hand this presentation off to Richard. Richard, take it away. Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar. My name is Richard Jack, and today Herb and I would like to go over the many bromate methods, discuss why they were developed, and the pros and cons of each. For my part of the webinar, I'll cover bromate toxicology, how bromate is formed, and go into a timeline for the methods 300.1, 317, and 326 that use a combination of conductivity and visible detection techniques. Then discuss how EK 300.1, using conductivity detection alone, was improved using new column technology and new eluents. Then set the stage for HERB, who will go into method validation and 2DIC. So for those of you who are not familiar with the term disinfection byproduct, bromate is part of several compounds that are formed during the disinfection of water. So as the name implies, 
they are byproducts of the disinfection process. Bromate is formed from the ozonation of bromide, while other disinfection byproducts are formed from chlorination or chloramination of organic matter or breakdown products of chlorine dioxide. So why is this important? Because the disinfection byproducts are toxic. Bromate causes many problems such as anemia and hearing loss and is highly carcinogenic. For this reason, it is regulated in most countries. This slide summarizes the bromate analysis techniques, the EPA method, columns and eluents, along with the detection step for each of the EPA methods. Note that a wide variety of columns can be used, flexibility of eluents, and lowering detection limits for the respective configurations. Importantly, conductivity detection t is today a viable option for bromate analysis. Because we're asked about these many methods, this webinar was created to provide some clarity as to when to use a particular method. Here I briefly summarize when a particular method can be used, along with how our Dionics now Thermo Fisher application notes for each of the corresponding EPA methods. It's important to know the matrix ion concentrations in your sample, and this will help you determine what method you can use. This table also shows the corresponding ISO, ASTM, and Japanese regulated methods for bromate. So we can see it's a worldwide problem that many countries have investigated and revalidated methods specifically for their statistical requirements. Here I show a timeline for bromate regulations, EPA method evolution, and our application notes. These three areas relate to each other over time. Bromate regulations have gotten lower, driving the need for updated EPA methods, which in turn drove the need for newer technology to meet the detection needs, robustness, and validation requirements for compliance monitoring. Over the last 20 years, the bromate maximum contamination level has gone down from 25 to 10 ppb, and currently Europe is considering lowering this further to three parts per billion. The following slides, I'll talk about the methods and application notes in more detail. In 1993, the state of the art for anion analysis using AS9SC carbonate eluent and conductivity detection. This method configuration was developed for anion analysis, not so much bromate. In the upper chromatogram, the anions are very close together and sulfate elutes much later at nine minutes. To allow better resolution, we developed AS9HC, a higher capacity column that allows better separation, especially bromate from chloride at peaks three and four. However, not all drinking water is the same. In the United States, the maximum secondary contaminant level for chloride and sulfate is up to 250 parts per million. So in this experiment, we increased the levels of chloride and sulfate from 50 to 200 ppm. And as we can see, our bromate peak becomes wider and eventually is not detected in higher salt waters. As we get close to the column capacity, bromate becomes undetectable. All of these samples are considered drinking water, but in reality, they can greatly vary in their salt concentration. For this reason, alternatives for more specific detection were needed. This slide shows the system configuration for EPA 300.1 and EPA 317. The EPA 300.1 configuration consists of the pump, column, suppressor, and conductivity detector. Then by adding additional hardware for the post-column addition of orthodianisidine and a visible detector, we have a configuration for EPA 317. So what does this new configuration provide for us? This is an example of one of the post-column methods that can be used for bromate analysis. The upper chromatogram is our suppressed conductivity trace, and the bottom chromatogram shows the post-column reaction using EPA 317. So we see two benefits right away. First, we have no interference from chloride, as we have seen in the previous slide, and two, taller peaks for chloride and bromate, essentially a matrix-blind system with increased sensitivity. This slide shows the IC system configuration required to perform method 326. Essentially, this method is also 300.1, but with additional hardware for the post-column addition of acidified potassium iodide to allow UV vis absorbance for enhanced detection of bromate. It differs from EPA 317 
in that a post-column reagent is generated online and used immediately. This allows detection of bromate over a large range, and the other analytes by ion chromatography with suppressed conductivity can also be used. The oxyhalided anions chlorite, chlorate, and bromide and bromate are separated on the column and measured using suppressed conductivity detection, followed by a post-column reaction to enhance detection of bromate. Also in this case, sensitivity of bromate is improved by a factor of 10 through this post-column reagent. The free iodide generated in situ reacts with bromate in the effluent to form triiodide anion. Triiodide is then detected by its strong absorbance at wavelength 352. Because the free iodide post-column reagent is generated online and used immediately, reagent purity and stability should be more easily ensured than in EPA 317. All of the key oxyhalided anions and bromide are quantified at low levels. In EPA method 326, the post-column reagent is generated online within the AMMS3 suppressor. Sulfuric acid needs to be added to the system to reduce potassium iodide to free iodide. The PCR reagent is used immediately so that reagent stability is not an issue. Bromate separated from the other analytes on the column combines with the freely acidified post-column reagent in the mixing tea. In a low dispersion knitted reaction coil, bromate reacts with iodide ion, ultimately oxidizing it to the triiodide anion. It is this triiodide that is detected with a strong absorbance at 352 nanometers. This slide shows the chromatograms from the direct injection of bottled water. The top trace was obtained with a conductivity detector, and the bottom trace was obtained by visible absorbance after post-column reaction. As we can see, it is matrix blind like 317, and we can clearly see our bromate in this sample. This slide summarizes what I've talked about so far. EPA method 300.1 with conductivity detection has a high limit of detection. If we have too much chloride in our sample, it obscures our bromate peak. For this reason, EPA 317 was developed. This method requires a post-column addition of ODA followed by visible detection. It requires additional hardware, frequent optimization of the post-column reagent flow rate. However, reagent purity can be an issue. Also, ODA is a human carcinogen, so we're kind of using a carcinogen to detect another carcinogen. For these reasons, EPA method 326 with post-column addition was developed and this also combines with uh, bromate to form triiodide anion followed by UV-vis detection. This method also requires hardware, but it generates in situ hydroiodic acid by the acidification of potassium iodide. This compound is photosensitive, and it too requires frequent optimization of PCR reagent flow rate. So while these methods were in use, we continue to explore the use of hydroxide eluent and also develop newer columns for both hydroxide and carbonate eluents and kind of revisited method 300.1. We did this because hydroxide eluent suppresses to water, and this provides a lower background conductivity. This lowers the noise, it improves the detection limits, gives us a large linear working range, and eluent is conveniently generated online. We also develop new columns with increased capacity to bind matrix anions like chloride. So the table below shows in 1993 the columns, the capacity, and the eluent. Note that between 1993 and 2007, we greatly improved the column capacity for both AS23 and AS29 using carbonate and hydroxide eluents. Here is the result of a bromate analysis using hydroxide eluent and AS19 by now, using hydroxide and a column with improved capacity and selectivity, we can easily resolve bromate from chloride as well as quantify other anions in our water sample. Suppression of hydroxide to water gives improved sensitivity and it allows reagent-free ion chromatography. So we can just add water to our system for a very robust and easier to use analysis. This shows the separation of anions comparing hydroxide and carbonate eluent using newer high-capacity columns. Both of these high-capacity columns separate common anions, like chloride and sulfate, 
from trace anion oxyhalide bromate chloride chlorate. The upper peak, using hydroxide, there's a little bit better separation and resolution between chloride and bromate, so it would be more robust for higher chloride-containing samples. Note also that hydroxide does not show a water dip compared to the carbonate-based eluent, allowing easier quantitation of fluoride and other organic acids in this region of the chromatogram. Here I'll just state that reagent-free ion chromatography using hydroxide eluents is more sensitive. Looking at the oxyhalides and calculated MDLs on the right between two columns and different eluents, we can see that AS19 has slightly lower detection limits comparing carbonate-based eluents and AS23. You can use both of these columns for compliance monitoring, but some people um, now have a choice uh, between the two different eluents. In this slide, we are comparing the sensitivity of, con of a conventional IC method with the sensitivity obtained by using RFIC. Here's a comparison of chloride and sulfate peaks in conventional methods. In both instances, the peaks are sharper and taller when using reagent-free ion chromatography. This allows us, under gradient conditions, to get sharper peaks and better detection limits. Though hydroxide eluents still give excellent sensitivity, the sample matrix is still important. In our application note, we did an experiment similar to what I showed earlier, how the increased amount of chloride affects recovery of a spiked water sample. Using AS19, we get about 90% 90, 90 recovery or greater from 0 to 150 ppm chloride, a vast improvement of AS9HC. So EPA 300.1 using conductivity detection could still be used for compliance monitoring for, for many water samples. However, as I mentioned, not all drinking waters are the same, and drinking waters that exceed 125 parts per million chloride will still have recoveries that are lower. For these drinking waters, an alternative technique was developed that Herb will talk about next. Herb? Thank you, Richard. As we uh, continue on here, we're going to talk about EPA methods. TRIO to are more importantly uh, 2D methods and the quality assurance requirements that were required by EPA to develop these methods. As we're all aware, one of the most challenging tasks for the analytical chemist is to accurately analyze trace levels of a target analyte in the presence of large excesses of similar but potentially interfering components. Because of the wide variety of surface and groundwaters found across the United States, that vary dramatically in ionic strength as well as the ever-changing total organic carbon load of surface waters, the United States Environmental Protection Agency developed very stringent quality assurance requirements within their drinking water method development protocols. Today I would like to describe the rationale for selecting the synthetic sample matrices used during method development for the analysis of bromate and perchlorate in drinking water, as well other quality assurance protocols that have been incorporated into method development and the final analysis protocols in order to ensure method robustness, precision, and accuracy will also be discussed. The most prevalent interference associated with ion chromatography is the potential for dramatic shifts in retention times to occur when high mineral content or high ionic strength matrices are analyzed. These matrices can dramatically overload the exchange sites in the column and thereby significantly reduce the target analyte's retention time, resulting in poor or non-detection of the analyte. Suppressed ion chromatographic methods for the analysis of inorganic anions in drinking water were first published by the US EPA Office of Research and Development in the late 1980s. The information collection rule, which involved collection of occurrence data for bromate in municipal drinking waters from across the United States, was scheduled to take place from July 1997 until early 1999. In order to increase sensitivity for the analysis of bromate in drinking water, the selective anion concentration, or SAC method, was developed between 1995 and 1996 by US EPA's Office of Water. This research method involved manual sample cleanup using a variety of pretreatment cartridges prior to injection of the sample. The sample then underwent a heart cutting step followed by separation and quantitation of the bromate contained in the heart cut sample. 
This method was used to collect the bromate of currents data for the ICR. But because it was very and extremely complex and very expensive to operate, it was never published as an EPA monitoring method. On the other hand, the occurrence data gathered during the ICR indicated that a more user-friendly method with better sensitivity was required for bromate compliance monitoring. During development of the SAC method, it was realized that the varying ionic strength of drinking waters holds significant challenges, which in this method were addressed by including sample pretreatment cartridges to remove the potential anionic interference prior to sample injection. The pretreatment step posed the greatest problems and were responsible for generating the very stringent protocols required for sample pretreatment. The introduction of the Thermo Fisher Dionyx AS9 high capacity columns afforded a fourfold increase in injection volume and a potential to significantly increase the detection limit for bromine. However, along with the increase in injection volume came a dramatic increase in the potential for interferences to overshadow any gains in method sensitivity. In 1997, publication of BPA Method 300.1 was the first step towards development of a more sensitive, user-friendly, bromate compliance method. It was during this work when the high inorganic water synthetic sample matrix was first incorporated. The HIW was designed to simulate a high ionic strength field sample in order to ensure that the method detection limit Precision and accuracy were not significantly different in the synthetic matrix compared to reagent water. Consequently, the high ionic water matrix became a method development requirement. In this method, the high ionic water was prepared from reagent water, which was fortified with the common anions of chloride, carbonate, and sulfate at 100 milligrams per liter, and nitrate and phosphate at 10 milligrams per liter as nitrogen and phosphorus, respectively. The bromate occurrence data continued to drive the search for a more sensitive method for the analysis of bromate. As a result, two post-column methods, EPA method 317 and 326, were published in 2001 and 2002, respectively. The same stringent synthetic sample matrix development protocols were incorporated in both of the post-column methods. The only difference was that 326 one milligram per liter of humic acid replaced the 10 milligrams per liter of fulvic acid, which was no longer available. The different ways that method detection limit has been defined over the years became an issue that EPA's Office of Groundwater and Drinking Water started to address in 2003. Consequently, in 2004, the lowest concentration minimum reporting level, or LCMRL, was incorporated into EPA's Office of Groundwater and Drinking Water Method Development. The single laboratory LCMRL is the lowest true concentration for which the future recovery is predicted to fall between 50 and 150 percent recovery with 99 percent confidence. While the exact details of the LCMR determination lie beyond the scope of this presentation, they are available on EPA's website. One final change that was included at this time is was the modification of the high organic matrix. Because it was difficult to obtain fulvic and humic acid in a pure form with consistent uniformity, and an alternative source for a high TOC drinking water was required. Fortunately, a municipal surface drinking water source with a year-round TOC of between 4 and 5 milligrams per liter was found very close to EPA's laboratory in Cincinnati, Ohio. Therefore, this municipal drinking water source became the higher organic water matrix quality control sample for all further method development work. Two-dimensional suppressed ion chromatography is essentially a column concentration, matrix elimination, second column confirmation analysis, which arose out of the method development work completed for the analysis of bromate and perchlorate in drinking water. This technique is currently used for the analysis of inorganic anions in drinking water. One final QC requirement for the 2D methods was inclusion of a printout of the first dimension chromatogram for the final high-level continuum calibration check standards and the laboratory fortified synthetic sample matrix continuum check standards. 
in order to ensure that the target analyte falls within the cut window in the first dimension. The following definitions describe the quality control samples which are required to be incorporated into an analysis batch in order to meet the data quality objectives for a typical EPA method. Analysis batch is a sequence of field samples which are analyzed within a 24-hour period and include no more than 20 field samples and must also include all required quality control samples. A laboratory reagent blank is an aliquot of reagent water or other blank matrix that is treated exactly as a sample, including exposure to the storage containers. The LRB is used to determine if the method analyte or other interferences are present in the laboratory environment, the reagent, or the apparatus. Calibration standard is a solution of the target analyte prepared from a primary stock standard solution. The calibration solutions are used to calibrate the instrument response with respect to analyte concentration. Continuum calibration check standards are calibration check standards containing the method analyte, which are analyzed periodically throughout an analysis batch to verify the accuracy of the existing calibration for that analyte. A laboratory fortified blank is an aliquot of reagent water or other blank matrix to which a known quantity of the method analyte is added. The LFB is analyzed exactly like a sample. Its purpose is to determine whether the methodology is in control and whether the laboratory is capable of making precise measurements. The laboratory duplicate are two sample aliquots, LD1 and LD2, from a single field sample bottle and analyzed separately with identical procedures. Analysis of LD1 and LD2 indicate precision associated specifically with laboratory procedures by removing variation contributed from sample collection and storage procedures. The laboratory fortified sample matrix is an aliquot of a field sample to which a known quantity of the method analyte is added. The laboratory fortified sample matrix is processed and analyzed exactly like a field sample and its purpose is to determine whether the field sample matrix contributes bias to the analytical results. The background concentration of the analyte in the field sample matrix must be determined in a separate aliquot, and the measured value in the laboratory fortified sample matrix corrected for the native concentration. A laboratory fortified sample matrix duplicate is a second aliquot of the field sample used to prepare the laboratory fortified sample matrix which is fortified and analyzed identical to the LFSM. The LFSMD is used instead of the laboratory duplicate to assess method precision and accuracy when the occurrence of the target analyte is infrequent. The laboratory synthetic sample matrix is an aliquot of reagent water that is fortified with the sodium salts of chloride, bicarbonate, sulfate, and if required, phosphate and nitrate. The purpose of the laboratory synthetic sample matrix is to ensure method precision and accuracy in a simulated, very high ionic strength synthetic drinking water matrix. The laboratory fortified synthetic sample matrix is an aliquot of the laboratory synthetic sample matrix, which is fortified with the target analyte. The LFSSM is used to set the start time for the cut window in the first dimension and also used to ensure the precision and accuracy for the method is in control. These samples are treated like continuing calibration check standards. A laboratory fortified synthetic sample matrix continuing calibration check standard is an aliquot of the laboratory synthetic sample matrix which is fortified with the target analyte at a concentration equal to one of the continuing calibration check standards. An LF SSMCCC at a concentration equal to the highest calibration level should be analyzed near the beginning or at the end of each analysis batch to confirm that the first dimension heart cutting procedure has acceptable recovery in organic matrices. Lowest concentration minimum reporting level, as discussed previously, the single laboratory LCMRL is the lowest true concentration for which the future recovery is predicted to fall between 50 and 150% recovery with 99% confidence. And a minimum reporting level 
is the minimum concentration that can be reported by laboratory as a quantified value for the target analyte in a sample following analysis. This defined concentration must be no lower than the concentration of the lowest calibration standard for the target analyte. Now, in the next uh, three slides, we'll show um, a typical analysis bench sequence for an EPA method. So the first sample is the laboratory reagent blank, where the acceptance criteria must be equal to or less than a third of the reporting limit. The next sample is a continuing calibration check standard at the MRL, where the recovery must be between 50 and 150 percent. And then you have the laboratory fortified blank. If it's at the MRL, recovery must be 50 to 150 percent. And if it's above the MRL, then 80 to 120 percent recovery is required. The next uh, two samples are analyzed. And then the second sample is the, also the laboratory fortified sample matrix, where the recovery must be between 80 to 120 percent recovery. And then you do the laboratory fortified sample matrix duplicate, where the relative percent difference must be plus or minus 20 percent. Then run the next 10 samples. We'll find that sample 16 after the 10th sample is a continuing calibration check standard at the midpoint or the mid-level, where the recovery is required to be 80 to 100 percent recovery. And that means that the first 10 samples and QC samples are bracketed by acceptable quality control standards. Run the next 10 samples and finish the analysis batch with the continuing calibration check standard at the high level and the laboratory fortified synthetic sample matrix continuing calibration check standard at the high level, where the recovery of these two must again between 80 and 120 percent recovery. So now that the last 10 samples are once again bracketed by acceptable quality assurance samples, then the 20 samples in the analysis batch are all acceptable, and the data can be accepted. Recently, a new analytical methodology termed two-dimensional matrix elimination on chromatography was introduced for the trace analysis of analytes in the presence of large excesses of matrix ions. The methodology uses a high-capacity 4-millimeter column in the first dimension to separate the analytes from the matrix ions. After separation, the suppressed eluent portion containing the analytes of interest is focused onto a concentrator column and subsequently analyzed in the second dimension using a smaller format column with different selectivity. The combination of the different column diameters and chemistries thereby results in enhanced sensitivity and selectivity. The introduction of capillary scale ion chromatography provides a unique opportunity to, to further improve the detection limits by using the capillary scale ion chromatograph in the second dimension. We'll next follow the development of the application of two dimensional methods for the, the analysis of drinking water and the most recent development for the analysis of bromine in, in drinking water using capillary IC format in the second dimension. Currently, trace level ion chromatography involves samples in two different types of matrices. In samples with low levels of matrix ions, the analysis is typically performed using pre-concentration or large volume direct injection, such as for the analysis of ultra pure water in the power industry. On the other hand, for samples with high levels of matrix ions, pre-concentration or large volume direct injection is usually not possible because the matrix ions may pollute with the analytes of interest, leading to recovery and integration issues due to band broadening. These matrix problems are frequently encountered in the analysis of drinking water and wastewater. In order to overcome these difficulties in samples with high levels of matrix ions, the samples require a pretreatment step using solid phase extraction cartridges. For example, a silver form cation exchange resin cartridge is used to remove high levels of chloride from the samples. In many instances, multiple cartridges may be required. Solid phase extraction methods are carried out offline and are labor intensive and add significant labor expense to the analysis, as well as the cost of equipment and cartridges. 
two-dimensional IC allows large volume injection in the first dimension using a four millimeter column. It is possible to inject a larger volume than the standard approach because the capacity and selectivity of the analytic column in the first dimension dictates the recovery. And the analyte of interest is analyzed in the second dimension. In the first dimension, the ions of interest are focused on a concentrator column and after separation in the first dimension. The hydroxide eluent is converted to DI water in the suppressor, providing an ideal environment for focusing or concentrating the ions of interest. 2D IC provides analysis in the second dimension using smaller diameter columns with different chemistry and yields increased sensitivity and selectivity. For example, using a one millimeter column which has a cross-sectional area of one sixteenth of the area of a four millimeter column provides a sensitivity enhancement factor of about 16 in the second dimension. Incorporating different column chemistries in the second dimension provides enhanced selectivity and second column conformation. Two-dimensional IC is easily implemented on the ICS 3000 or 5000 system. Two-dimensional suppressed ion chromatography is essentially a column concentration, matrix elimination, second column confirmation analysis, which arose out of the method development completed for the analysis of bromate and perchlorate in drinking water. The technique is currently used for the analysis of inorganic anions in drinking water. The two-dimensional instrument setup, which involves essentially two chromatographic systems, is shown in this slide. In the first dimension, the four millimeter column provides a separation of the analyte of interest from the matrix interferences, and the analyte of interest is then focused on the concentrator column and an analyzed using a smaller format column with different selectivity in the second dimension. The divertive valve, which is shown in red, is only required when more than one cut window is incorporated in the first dimension. The effects of increasing matrix concentration on the bromate peak shape and recovery is shown in this slide. Chromatogram A shows that the bromate peak for a five microgram per liter bromate fortification in reagent water is well defined. However, as the level of chloride and sulfate increases through chromatograms B through F, the bromate peak is distorted and eventually not resolved from the chloride peak. And this, in fact, is a very low level of matrix interference, which can, in fact, be significantly higher in actual drinking water field samples. USPPA developed two-dimensional methods using four-millimeter columns in the first dimension and two-millimeter columns in the second dimension. EPA method 302 for the analysis of bromate and EPA method 314.2 for the analysis of perchlorate in drinking water. Currently, other methods utilizing capillary IC format in the second dimension are at various stages of development. These include methods for bromate, chromate, and the five regulated haloacetic acids. When a smaller diameter analytical column is used in the second dimension, there is an increase in sensitivity that is proportional to the column cross-sectional areas. For example, when a 4 millimeter column with a 1 millimeter per minute flow rate is used in the first dimension and a 2 millimeter column with a flow rate of 0.25 mils per minute is used in the second dimension, an approximate four-fold increase in sensitivity is observed. However, when you go to a 0.4 millimeter capillary column with a flow of 10 microliters per minute in the second dimension, and the uh, four millimeter column is used in the first dimension, an almost 100 fold increase in sensitivity is observed. Now as shown in this slide, part per trillion levels of bromate are readily detected in reagent water and in the bottled water indicated approximately 54 parts per trillion of bromate using a one mil direct injection of sample in the 2D IC method with capillary format system in the second dimension. In conclusion, two-dimensional matrix elimination ion chromatography with suppressed conductivity detection is a relatively new analytical technique for the analysis of drinking water. 
using the standard protocols with a 4mm column in the first dimension and a 2mm column with different selectivity in the second dimension. In 2005, EPA published method 302.0 as a compliance monitoring method for the analysis of bromate in drinking water. The method has met and exceeded all EPA requirements for robustness, precision, and accuracy. EPA has also published method 314.2 using 2DIC for the analysis of perchlorate in drinking water. As well, two-dimensional line chromatography incorporating capillary IC techniques in the second dimension with suppressed conductivity detection is a very new, extremely sensitive analytical technique for the analysis of drinking water. Currently, the method is being evaluated for the analysis of PPT levels of bromate in drinking water. As well, a 2D IC method with capillary format in the second dimension for the analysis of the five regulated haloacetic acids is currently undergoing second lab validation studies. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your attention. Thank you, Richard and Herb, for a very interesting presentation. Um, we have received a number of questions about your presentation, and we'll try and get to as many of them as time allows. And remember, to ask a question, use the Q&A box on your screen. We'll go to the first question, um, and this is for Herb. Um, how long does the validation process take? Uh, <clears throat> the validation process, if just doing the experimental work, can be maybe two weeks. Once you have the method all set up and running well, it could be two weeks to a month to collect the data uh, for the lab that's doing the second lab validation. Um, and once that data is accepted, then it, it has to be written up uh, and presented to EPA. So once the method is and data is written, then it has to be valid, um, reviewed internally at EPA uh, comments made, corrected, uh, and addressed, and then it has to go to external review. And once again, all comments require um, to be addressed. Uh, so it could be two months worth of lab work and then six months to a year before the final method is published. Okay. Um, and I'll take another question here. I think this one might be for Richard. Um, can I use cap a, a capillary system for the 2D IC method? Um, yeah, we get asked that from time to time, and just the short of it is yes. Uh, the EPA has uh, flexibility parameters for all methods and things like new columns, um, sometimes new eluents can be used uh, for and still be in compliance for EPA monitoring. You still have to go through, of course, and um, do the validation, make sure you meet the statistical requirements like detection limit and reproducibility, accuracy, and precision, things like that. But uh, going to capillary or one millimeter, two millimeter columns, whatever you like, is, is, no, is acceptable within EPA guidelines. Okay. Um, this question is for Herb. Um, in your presentation, Herb, you cited humeric and alert uh, Fulvic acid um, in your presentation. Anyway, um, what's the source for the standard humeric materials that you used? Uh, originally, the <coughs> fulvic acid we uh, extracted and recrystallized from uh, surface water, and extracted uh, after extraction, and we um, added that back into reagent water. We purchased a humic acid at one point, but because of the variability. Uh, we were having a lot of problems, and that's why we went to a, a local uh, municipal water that has a year-round total organic carbon level of between 4 and 5 milligrams per liter. And that uh, tended, uh, seemed to work very well uh, cons consistently throughout the year. Okay. And that's been, that's been in place for several years. Okay. All right. Um, our next question. Um, I believe this one also might be something for Herb. Um, how does Hello everybody? My name is Susan Morrissey, and I am assistant. Sorry, uh, technical difficulties. The next question is for Herb. Um, how does the lowest concentration minimum reporting limit, the LCMRL, compare with the method reporting limit, the MRL? Well, method reporting limits have <coughs> tr 
traditionally be, been calculated on precision, whereas the LCMRL is based upon both precision and accuracy. I, that, that's a very brief explanation of it. Uh, if they wanted more details, look on uh, EPA's website where it is defined. Okay. All right. Um, next question. I think this might be best answered by Richard. Um, is there a simple test for detecting bromate in groundwater? Good question. I, I did see a presentation, um, and there is a kit, um, but it, it was the, the speaker complaint. It actually was this year at PitCon, uh, and the speaker said it was not very, very accurate. So they went ahead. They were doing groundwater samples, um, and they were, I, I don't know, he didn't go into detail, and I didn't investigate it further, but it wasn't very accurate, and there were, it was subject to interferences, which is uh, probably why you need uh, the chromatography, but yet yeah, orthodynicity is specific for both bromate, I believe also for chlorite or chlorate. I, Herb, you may know more about chlorate, this than that, I do. That's, that's why at one point, if, if the level of chlorite was above a certain level, it had to be removed before you could get accurate yeah. uh, mm -hmm. bromate levels. Right. Yeah. Okay. So there, there is a kit. I can't remember. I don't know the name of it, but probably if you search online, you could find it. But just keep in mind, if you do use it, you have to, you know, test it, test its accuracy, All right. especially background levels. Okay. Um, the next question, um, and Herb, you might want to answer this one. Um, do you have any idea when EPA 302 will be promulgated? 302. 302. I thought it had been put on the fast track uh, to to be regulated. Richard, do you know if that it has not gone through yet? It, it should be. Yeah, it was in over a year. Uh, I think December two thousand nine. It is on the EPA Office of Groundwater and Drinking Water's website. Okay. I believe it has. So as far as from as far as from Cincinnati. Now, it, sometimes the different regions. Um, Will, won't know what's available or been validated in Cincinnati. So what I have to sometimes do is talk to an auditor in a particular region in North America, and then I usually get into a discussion, and then we have a chat, and then that auditor will contact um, Cincinnati, where the Office of Groundwater and Drinking Water is. Before it was David Munch. Now it's a gentleman named Steve Wendelkin, mm -hmm. and then he can pretty much give guidance for that. But 302 is, promulgate, is promulgated, and it's on the uh, EPA's website. Okay. All right. Um, the next question, um, I believe, will um, this might be for Richard. I am using EPA method 317 and often have problems with the post-column reagent. Do you have any um, recommendations for better preservation? Mm. Yeah, we get that one a lot. It's not something we can speak to directly because we do not, of course, manufacture the reagent, but um, it, it does have a short um, half-life, and I believe you just need to replace it weekly. I mean, Herb, Her you may address this when you did the validation. It, was, it seemed to be a little bit more stable than it is today. But I, from what I do know, people do complain about it, and we just ask that they you know, Prepare, change right. it out every, every week or so. Well, Go ahead, Herb. Prepare fresh daily if you can. I mean, daily, if yeah. you're running today and you want to run tomorrow, prepare it tomorrow morning. Um, because it, there, there is a lot of problems with the stability of it now. If there's any way you could switch and do 326, um, the problems go away. Okay. All right. Um, next question is, um, can EPA 314.2 and 302 be run on the same instrument, and can an instrument be set to run them both at the same time? Richard, you going to handle that? Can you repeat that sure. again? Sure. Um, can EPA method 314.2 and 302 be run on the same instrument, and can the instrument be set to run them at the same time? Well, the first, the first thing I would say is there are different columns with different selectivities, um, and that's going to really depend on your matrix. I mean, okay, legally it can um, because you can use different columns. Both columns for bromate and perchlorate are, you know, ion exchange and ion exchange columns. However, 
Uh, 302 uses uh, AS19 and AS24, and then perchlorate uses AS16 and AS20 in a 2D format. So it would really depend on your matrix, and if you're uh, you may have problems on the 24, especially using AS24 with perchlorate. Um, you would just, the only, you know, I hate to say this, but you just, you would just have to try it. It would really depend on your samples, but they are different columns with their different selectivity, so I wouldn't recommend it, especially if you have a groundwater sample that has a lot of sulfate in it. It would be very, very hard to separate those out. All right. And get the selectivity. Okay. Now, you could do both of them on the same instrument, provided you switch the columns. You couldn't have done them exactly. simultaneously. Exactly. That's right. That's right. All right. Um, the next question is, is um, what is the total runtime for 2D IC for the bromate method? I think it's under 40, 45 minutes. I yeah. Haven't that, I haven't done that one for a while, but I, I would believe I... I would say you're probably around 40 to 50 minutes, somewhere in there. All right. Mm -hmm. Now, the, just let me just add one point. You can, we have uh, built into the system, uh, there, there is a way to do an overlap, which may shorten the time somewhat. So you can start, you can actually load the first injection while the second one is running. So we, you know, we have to look into that more closely. Okay. All right. Um, I think this is a question for Herb. Um, what is the acceptable control limit of MRL in EPA 300.1B for bromate? Is it 25% or 50%? Oh, that I'm not sure of. Uh, if you go online and look at the method, it should be in, in the method on EPA's website if you look up 300.1 and part, part A and Part B. They should be defined. Okay. All right, um, and here's a, a general question for you. Is there any comparisons between 2D IC methods and IC, ICP, MS methods for bromate analysis? We have not done a side-by-side -side comparison, no, unfortunately. Herb, do you know anyone who has? No. Um, yeah. The only really in-depth one we did was between um, the SAC method and the post-column methods. And then when we went to um, 302, we did some comparison between the post-column methods and the 2D method, but okay. nothing that I'm aware of with ICP. Okay. All right. Um, and uh, here's the next question. Was validation done on ICS-3000 or ICS-5000? For which? Uh, for bromine? I'm assuming for bromine. Yeah, for bromine would have been done on the 3000. All right. Yep. And then another question related to the, the ICS-5000 um, equipment. Um, they're asking if there's any long-term long stability um, work done with it. For um, longer-term stability. Longer-term stability. Uh, well, it's similar to the um, the, the five thousand is, is similar to the three thousand. Just to clarify, it we, with the five thousand, we just put in the ability to do capillary, so we did not change too much uh, to the system. So they are very, very similar. Mm -hmm. um, but it, it was launched last year, and yeah, several, we did beta, alpha and beta tests after we made this, the modification to take the capillary components. Uh, and then some people are running them continuously. Um, I don't know about 2D application, but they're, they're running it continuously for just um, 300.1 or variety of, of methods for anion analysis. And I know some people are doing 300.1 for bromate and having uh, the success with the instrument. Okay. Um, we'll have time for one more question. So this will be the last question. Um, I have an ICS 5000 and have validated 300.1 for CAP AS19, um, but have issues with the auto sample, auto sampler chloride retention carryover. Is this common, and how can it be prevented? Chloride 
fluoride retention and carryover um, mm -hmm. is common. No, it is not common. Um, I don't know how much chloride is in this particular sample, but it should, you know, chloride is not part of the instrument and it's, it's very soluble, so there should not be much in carryover. You may want to try an extra wash step or wash the syringe between injections, which is certainly um, possible with this instrument. Or may try an extra, yeah, just try an extra wash step. But it is not common, no. All right. Um, even, we even have people doing brine analysis you know, very, very high salt levels. Um, so it's it's hard to say. I, I really need to talk to. I'll I'll, I'll tell you what. I'll I'll, really need to, I'll contact this person um, offline and and get in, give them some more detail. And I need some more information to answer it. All right. More clearly. Right. Yeah. Well, that's all we have time for. So thank you again, Richard and Herb, for your fascinating presentation, and thank you um, participants for being a great audience. Be sure to check back to CNEN and CNEN online for information on our next edition of CNEN webinars. And thank you ON24 for technical and production services. And thank you Thermo Fisher Scientific for sponsorship that's made this interactive webcast possible. For CNEN webinars, I'm Susan Morrissey. Goodbye.